Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm Morgan of the Coracle Committee, sponsored by the Sisterhood of Avalon. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for Coracle Live Books, Bards, and Ballads, where I will be chatting with Erin Aurelia. Um, so, Erin has a wonderful book coming out in June of 2023. She's the author of The Torch of Bridget, Read. Flame Tending for Transformation, we published by Moon Books, and she shares how flame tending for the Irish goddess breed, when combined with own work, becomes a transformative daily practice that facilitates creativity, emotional healing, and spiritual growth. She has been flame tending for breed for 20 years and created and managed the Daughters of Breed flame tending order for eight of them. She is also known in the community of Brigadine flame tenders and devotees for her annual Invoke Advent and Celebration blog series. Additionally, she is the owner of Sunshine Editorial Services and Book Coaching, where she helps creative nonfiction writers who want to be change makers write their best books. So, Erin, welcome. Thank you, Morgan. It's nice to be here. Very nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, so, why don't you? Why don't we start with? Let's go back in time to twenty years ago, and how you got involved with breed, and um, and flame tending. And if you could explain a little bit about what flame tending is to you. Well, to define flame tending for anyone here who isn't familiar with that term, it is an intermittent devotional practice that was originally created in the Catholic tradition of Ireland. And it was revolving around the Saint Bridget and the keeping of a perpetual fire that was part of the tradition at the house that she founded in Kildare. Mm -hmm. And it was said that after she died, the practice continued on and on. And she had been one of those tending the flame. And it was said that on the 20th night, there were 19 nuns and her who would take turns each night keeping this flame going. And on the 20th night, it was said, Bridget, it's your night, keep your night. And then the nuns would come back the following morning and the flame would still be going. And this would happen after she had died, so the stories say. And so her spirit became a part of that flame. And it was uh, lit and put out and lit and put out as time went on in the past between Catholic and Protestant and Church of England churches. And then finally, at one point, it was put out altogether as Ireland became uh, dominated more and more by English forces. <clears throat> the practice was resurrected in 1993, simultaneously, unbeknownst to both parties, on two sides of the world on Imolk or St. Bridget's Day in 1993, there were a group of Brigine nuns in Ireland who relit the flame in honor of St. Bridget. And on the same day, on the other side of the world in British Columbia, Canada, a woman named Mel Brigda relit the flame with friends of hers in honor of the goddess breed. And from that relighting of hers in Canada, she created the Daughters of the Flame Flame Tending Order, which has worldwide membership. And I am a member of that as well and became so some time ago. <clears throat> so the practice itself, as I said, is an intermittent practice in which there is a core group of 20 women, which today could be a group that involves men or women, depending on the group, could be Christians or pagans, could be Christians and pagans, all depends on the group. But the general idea is that each person is assigned a 24 hour shift in which they tend a flame, which is dedicated to breed. And during that time, they can meditate, they can pray, they can engage in hobbies and pursuits that are related to the goddess in some way, or that honor the saint in some way. It's up to them how to use that time. And then every 20 days they get another shift. What I felt like was that I wanted more time with Breed. I felt like this could be more of a spiritual practice on a daily level. This could be a deeper practice if it could be engaged in more regularly. And of course, 
one could just light the flame intended every day. There are even some who do that as a personal dedication. Mm -hmm. But I also felt that this practice could offer some more. And so slowly <clears throat> I began seeing things that I hadn't seen before in the practice. I began noticing that this 20 days could be seen as a sequence as kind of a process in itself, rather than just each individual day as some standalone entity. And um, uh, several years ago, I started working with the OM and learning more about that. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that in the main body of the trio OM that people work with, there are 20 characters. And I noticed how that kind of aligns neatly with 20 nights of the flame tending cycle. And I looked at the OM and I thought this too could be something viewed as a whole, as a continuum, rather than just 20 separate individual pieces that can give us information and enlightenment. What if this were a process it's similar in the way to some view the major arcana of the tarot? Some engage with that as a depiction of a spiritual journey from beginning to end from the fool card all the way to the world, that there is a process of transformation that happens in that journey. And I thought, what if the OM represented such a journey? What if that were something that I could engage in during those 20 nights of my flame tending with the assistance of Breed, with her guidance? What could that show me? And I began experimenting from there, working with one of the OM trees each of those 20 nights mm -hmm. and feeling through them as a sequence, as a development. And also the OM lends itself well to that, I think, because it's divided into four groups called ACME. And those four groups can be equated with the four seasons, which can then also give another layer of a cycle of development in which something begins to grow and then flowers and fruits, and then ripens, and then the seeds develop and drop. And then with that drop, there becomes a whole new idea to begin with in that growth cycle when the flame tending cycle begins again. When when you use the OM, do you, for the 20, 20 days, mm -hmm. do you do it in the same order, the trees in the same order each each time or do you switch yeah. it up a little bit you do okay no it's it's an order it goes it's it's a uh, uh it, it fell into place for me as a system of working with the different faces of breed reflected in the different stages of the oem the oem begins with bay with birch which is said to relate with beginnings and initiations so mm -hmm. this is like the initiation and beginning of a spiritual journey in which we can come to breed and bring a part of ourselves that we want to work on that we want to deepen an understanding of that we may need healing with and that first phase that first acme is uh, related to that concept of growth and beginnings. And I see the face of Breed the Smith resonating with that. The, the Smith is all about building and creating forms and structures. And so this gives us the place that we're beginning. And we can also envision this as this is the beginning of a sapling growing from a cracked seed. So I see these cycles sort of playing out as they go. And in the second acme, I, re I feel resonates with breed the healer. Now we have a form in place and now we delve into the inside of the form. And what does that show us? Where do we bring balance to ourselves? Where do we face what gives us fear or what gives us anxiety? And how do we use that energy and transmute it into something that gives us joy and feeds our passions? So I, so the woman that was in, did you say British Columbia, did she have a temple to breed or did she just do this when she lit the fire? She lit the fire, I believe, in her personal home space. Okay. And then she developed the online flame tending order that has international membership. This so is all in the world. Personally for yourself with the flame tending. Um, so we know that in Kildare, the, the flame does not go out. 
-hmm. So when you do this personally, do you keep this lit 24 seven? I don't. You do not. Okay. No. And, and anyone who is doing the standard flame tending practice, there is a 24 hour window that's dedicated to their shift in which they can tend the flame for as many of those hours as they're able to. And for many of us who go to work and have other obligations, we find other ways to sort of keep that alive, whether we use electric candles or maybe put a, a, a photo of a flame on our phone that we can set on a desk. I have used jewelry as well. I'm wearing a Bridget's cross. And so that's something I would do also on flame tending days when I'm out and about and not able to sit home with my flame. And even with my flame tending becoming a daily practice for me, uh, the flame is mainly lit when I am sitting and doing my meditation work. Okay. Somebody's jumping ahead, Aaron, and wanting to know about the third acme. I see it. Yes. <laughs> Following right along. Yes, the third acme, I feel, resonates with Breed the Poet. This is the third acme I also see in that growth of the tree stage. This is when the, the grown fruit from the second phase is now ripening. And the poet is where the wisdom that we live through is the ripening of our understanding. <clears throat> um, and this is the place where we transmute the, the form we've created, the balance we've brought, and now what is the wisdom that comes from that, that we've gone through? And how does Breed help us see and understand that wisdom so that we can integrate it? And then, because the natural next question someone's going to ask is, what about the fourth acme? The fourth acme, I feel, resonates with a face of Breed that is not commonly seen, that I have come to call Breed the dreamer. And I take this from Scottish lore that's noted in a Scottish Gaelic book called the Carmina Gedelica that talks about old traditions in Scotland, primarily Catholic traditions. And so some of those are around St. Breed there. And this particular one I'm thinking of, for those who might be familiar with it and those who aren't, is the story of the snake rising from the hole. The serpent from the knoll is said to come up on St. Breed's day. And that this is a sign of the changing of the seasons, the coming of spring, the rising of the life force from the land. And so because there's this arising and there is this awakening, it therefore implies that there was this sleeping and there was this dreaming. And in the process of equating the acme with the growth cycle of a tree, this is the period where I see now the ripened fruit has developed seeds inside and the seeds are what carry on to create the new cycle. So the seeds drop and mm -hmm. the seeds spend the winter season sleeping under the earth, just as the serpent hibernates and sleeps under the earth. We can think of Breed as sleeping with her life energy as well in this phase, holding that dream, fully integrating what was learned in that cycle and what was given and looking within it to see what the seed is of the next cycle. What does it show us that we can go even further with or even deeper with? What is the next inquiry we can follow? And then we bring that with us into the next cycle when we start again with the first acne. So I'm always curious how women start in their journey on goddess spirituality. So how did you start? Do, and do you feel that, that Breed called you? What brought you to the goddess? Because it's not something, even now, I think that a lot of women are even aware of the fact that there's this, that there's goddess spirituality. You know, they stumble across it and there's something that just says, mm -hmm. oh, 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 this, this is perfect. This, this, is, this is what I need. So what, what is your goddess backstory, I guess? Uh, it was a stumbling across it. Yes, I think that's very much how it happens. It happened to me. Actually, it began all the way back in the mists of time when I was in high school, <laughs> which was forever ago. <laughs> and uh, I think it was my junior year, I was doing a term paper on the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. So I went to the library and I looked up whatever I could find out about witches and witchcraft. And all of a sudden, I'm finding all of these books about traditional witchcraft, about Wicca, 
about goddess spirituality. And I'd never seen any of this before. I had um, briefly gone to church when I was very young, when my mom had a brief stint with Pentecostalism. And then five years later, she decided she'd rather be a heretic and left the church. So other than that, I <laughs> have not had any other kind of rigorous uh, religious training. But I felt like these kinds of traditions spoke to me because they honored nature and they honored women. They honored the movement of the life force. They honored and understood death and its process of transformation. And I really appreciated those points of view because I did not see them prevalent in the culture around me. So they called to me very much. Yeah, and we, we still don't really see that in the culture around us. And I agree. And I love doing things like this so that you know, we get the word out there even more and, you know, to let women know that there's something else out there. Exactly. Calling you. Yes. That, that there's more than this patriarchal, traditional stuff that we're surrounded with, that, they're, that there's something out there that speaks to us as women young girls, you know, that tells us we're worthy, we're valued, you know, we are made in the image of goddess as opposed to we are not made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's wonderful. So once you found this path, how mm -hmm. did you, because I know just for myself and talking to other women, the path goes like this. It's never, yeah, it does. I'm going to do this and this is where we end up. But it doesn't work that way. You start here and you're all over the place before you end up where you end up. It's so true. You never even yeah. know where you're going to end up because, I mean, I didn't have any thought when I found this. I'm like, this is great. This is it. And then I didn't know it was going to develop from there right. because I don't know till it happens. Um, <clears throat> but the following year in 12th grade, I did a term paper. And these were papers where I got to choose the topics. So I guess it was telling in itself that I was already drawn to looking into something. Yeah. Um, well, with my name being Aaron and having Irish heritage, I was always interested in Irish traditions and stories. And so in the 12th grade, I did a term paper on Irish mythology. So then I looked up all of that and became completely enamored with all of those stories and all of those characters. And those stayed with me for quite some time. Several years later, I <clears throat> became more focused exclusively on goddess worship and goddess tradition. And so, of course, learning about all of the different goddesses worldwide, including Bridget. Mm -hmm. And several years again after that, going through the turns, um, I felt like I really wanted to sink more into a tradition that was aligned with <clears throat> some of my background, wanting to connect more with my ancestors mm -hmm. yep. and their path and their understanding and their worldview. And so that led me into studying specifically Celtic traditions and most specifically Irish tradition and Scottish tradition. And Reed is huge in the Irish tradition. And so... Uh, I I was very interested in her. Uh, when she came to me, though, actually showed up, it was in a most unexpected situation in something that I would never have thought would have necessarily happened. I was at the time studying Reiki, and I was getting a second attunement from my Reiki master. Mm -hmm. And during that process of attunement, I felt that heat of Reiki come over me and fill me. And all of a sudden I saw Breed's face in front of me and this flame surrounding her and <clears throat> felt that she was showing me that this energy is an iteration of her energy and that she, that's what she wanted me to connect with in this. And I felt a resonance of her as a healer in this with Reiki being this hands-on healing technique of the universal life force energy. And so I primarily connected with her through healing. And then several years later after that, well, and then I became a flame tender. As soon as I found out I had that experience, someone told me about flame tending. And I said, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I must know more. So I looked up online and I first found a group called the Ord Brijak, with the, uh, the Order of Bridget. And that is uh, another one of the oldest and most longstanding international flame tending orders online. And I was a member of that order for a while. And then I felt like I wasn't 
getting enough of a community experience from that at the time. And so I left and I found the Daughters of the Flame and joined that. And I was a part of that for a while. And then I left and then I felt like I just want something that feels like, mm, what do I want? What do I want? I wanted to be able to create something that really spoke to uh, the Celtic polytheist experience mm -hmm. of engaging with breed. And that is when I was inspired to create the Nienembrisia Flame Tending Order or the Daughters of Bridget Flame Tending Order. And I managed that for eight years. And a lot of the work that I have put into this book was developed at the time that I was tending that order. I was um, developing a lot of prayers and meditations and rituals that had to do with honoring Bridget throughout the flame tending cycle, throughout the moon cycle, throughout the seasonal cycle. And uh, my life completely changed after about eight years of doing that. I went through a divorce and moving house and I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with it anymore. And I handed it over to someone else who sounds like is doing a great job taking care of it. Thank you very much, Carrie. And I rejoined um, the Daughters of Bridget and was very happy to have a place where I could be in that community and just kind of sit quietly in my corner and try to process and put myself back together. And after a few years of that, this practice became stronger in my consciousness. And interestingly, it came back to me as I re-engaged with doing the work that's outlined by the Sisterhood of Avalon. And I'm not really sure why. <laughs> I don't know what the connection is. It's not a Bridget specific connection, but for some reason, it's the depth of the work I think that I do that shows me where I need to look and where I need to go. And it stimulates so much within me. And I began to see all of these little prayers and rituals and meditations I'd had that I had written and engaged in. All of a sudden they began to fall together into this sort of clear cohesive system and this larger development of a process of spiritual transformation in working with these different stages, these different faces of breed through the different stages of the oum, and that it just keeps feeding itself and circling around and round and like the spiral that keeps feeding and never ending. And it just looked like this eternal dance with breed and her eternal flame. And, and I said, that's it. That's the thing I have to write. <laughs> there it is. So do you feel that she is behind you writing this book? Did she say, Psst, go write this book? Or is this just oh, all the work that you've done? I think, I think it's both. I think it's fair to say it's both. I mean, the, the other uh, face of Breed I resonate very strongly with is Breed the Poet. I am a poet myself. Um, I wrote prolifically in my youth and then somehow for about 20 years, I didn't write that much. Mm -hmm. And it turned out I was in this not great marriage. And that once I left it, I hear you. It all began to come back. And I've been a pretty prolific writer in the last five years since then. So um, in resonating with her, this, this element of inspiration of just when I begin to see it and understand it, and it all comes together, I feel like it, it seems like it's like I'm seeing it and I'm doing it, but that inspiration that comes in, that's where Breed is. And as a poet, I resonate with that very much. In fact, in my book, I have a couple of my poems. I was going to ask you if you would like to share one of your poems. Maybe I would love to. I would, thank you. Yeah. They are in my book, this book, The Torch of Breed which will, as was noted, be available in June of 2023. It is available for pre-order currently on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Excellent. And uh, I have poems as bookends. One begins the book and one ends the book. And so I'll read you the one that begins the book since we always begin at the beginning. This is okay. called What She Speaks When I Tend Her Flame. I transform, she says, the raw meat into food, 
the raw thoughts into poetry, the raw materials into arts and crafts, the raw ore into weapons and tools, the raw plants into healing drafts. In your heart, distress to peace. In your mind, worry to reassurance. In your body, death into life, then life into growth. In your life, suffering into power. I transform by the grace of the flame. She said, you too can embody transformation. From chaos to order, from complacency to vigilance, from disease to healing, from loneliness to togetherness, from other worlds to this world, from outside to in, from self to others, like a gift. Gifting is gracing. Gift yourself, gift another, and then another. Receive in grace, gift in grace, become grace. And then we become the flame, her flame in this world. So shine on for her, for you, for all. Oh, Erin, that's beautiful. Thank you, Morgane. That is so lovely. I really love performing my poetry. So thanks for inviting me to share a piece. Yeah, and I'd like you to share the other one before oh, we end as well. Right. Um, since you know Erin brought up her poetry, um, she has three poetry collections so far: Bone, Bone and Stars, mm -hmm. Love Conspiracy, and Feral. That sounds really interesting, Feral. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the culmination of the triad. Uh, these are not published yet, but I am working on putting together a manuscript in which those will be three chapters of a book. <clears throat> Bone and Stars is. Uh, the poetry I wrote, Recovering from uh, the Abusive Marriage I Left, mm -hmm. and Finding Myself Again After That. Love Conspiracy is unrequited love that happened along the way of my trying to recover myself and still somewhat falling into the habit of orienting to someone else other than myself. Mm -hmm. And Feral is the truly fully coming back to myself in my sovereignty and my power. I love that. The that undomestication of that my power. Just, that just sounds so perfect. Um, <laughs> it really is. And, and, and I really, I, for myself, and I know this isn't about me, this is about you, but I resonate with that because I'm actually going through a divorce right now. So, and I'm living, I'm still living with. Oh, <laughs> much so, love and power and strength to you, sister. Yeah, so, so the idea of, of what you have put in behind this, you know, and ending with feral and, and grabbing on to, you know, your authenticity and your sovereignty, because that's what I've been working toward. And I'm hoping that within a couple of months, I'm going to be, you know, where you are. Um, so you I can't wait to celebrate you in that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So you do open mics in where you around where you live, nobody needs to know. Yeah. And um, so with musicians, so do you sing or do you speak the poems with the music? Yes, it's performing spoken word. Okay. Is what I do. And um, <clears throat> I just let my musician friends know, here's the title, here's the mood of the piece. Now show me what it sounds like. That, that Just put it together. It's like magic. It's the most yeah. fun thing. It's that just sounds, pure play. It's the best thing in my world. <laughs> It's, it sounds beautiful because, as I said to you before we started, I do poetry as well. And I just grabbed myself a Celtic carp because I'm hoping to do my poetry accompanied nice. by the harp. Oh, so, I can't wait to hear this. Uh, yes. Let's see. Um, let's see. Ben. Hi, Ben. Says, it strikes me perhaps part of tending the flame of greed is also tending the flame of self. Holding vigil to the person you're becoming, especially as you both talk about endings and partings. I think that's very perceptive of you, Ben. Yes, is that this is as much of getting to know breed and engaging with breed as it is really getting to know ourselves and engaging with ourselves and deepening into who we are, who we truly are in our undomesticated 
feral selves outside of all of the coverings we have to put on to engage with the world around us on a daily yes. basis yes. and how those things actually cover up and obscure who we truly are, not just to others, but to ourselves. It is we who need to know ourselves exactly. in order to grow. And when all of this can be lifted away, then we can see it and not only see it, but see where it needs growth and nourishment and care so it can truly flower and transform into who we're meant to be. And like you said earlier, I find, um, I'm, I mean, I'm not a follower of breed per se, um, but I'm very attracted to the Celtic and the work that we do in the Sisterhood of Avalon mm -hmm. is so deep it and truly healing. And, and mm -hmm. the whole fact of how, how we deal with um, our cycle of healing you know, so that we're descending and we're coming back up. And it's the whole part of, you know, becoming feral, I think. This is because we have so many, I call them masks. Everyone sees something else when they look at you. Mm -hmm. And what you just said, I think, makes a lot of sense that sometimes we, we can lose very easily who we are because we're trying to be everything to everyone, everyone else. else. And yes. we get lost. We yes. get lost. And I think the SOA work we do really helps us to find ourselves. And uh, I know she's here, so I'll say it anyway. Jenna is amazing. I think she's yes. a genius for what she's done, not just for herself, but for all the women, you know, that have come to that, like you and I, and we find, mm -hmm. we find ourselves. Yes. You know, best parts of ourselves. I agree. Jenna is amazing. And her work has been so uh, instructive and influential on me. And I'm tickled to say that she wrote a beautiful blurb for my book. And it's such a fangirl moment for me that she did that. <laughs> <laughs> such an influential author to me. Yes. Uh, has had such lovely things to say about my book. <clears throat> we have, let's see, Kelly asks, do you incorporate any aspects of your flame tending practice with your SOA? <laughs> Avalonian healing, revealing practice. Stop. Be careful. We can say whatever we want. You're not here. So Jenna, you combine your <laughs> flame tending with your SOA practices. Uh, the answer is no. I don't do that. Um, I need to kind of hold each system in its own space so that I can best um, delve into the work it has to offer. So for me, it doesn't really work to conflate them, although they may be happening simultaneously, just maybe like on different nights or different times of the clock. <laughs> and there's a lot of similarity in the pattern. So I can understand why that question would be asked. Um, but also they don't necessarily neatly line up in the, the time since the Avalonian work tends to go around the, the moon cycle. And mm -hmm. when you're on a cycle of every 20 days, it's not related to anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like part of my early struggle of like, I want this to like feel like something. <laughs> and it, it doesn't go with the moon. It doesn't go with the moon. It doesn't go with the every 20 days. It just seems so weirdly random. But yeah. um, when I aligned it with the 20 OM trees and that is a process, then I felt like, all of a sudden, and uh, I remember Jenna has said this before when we've chatted, uh, she says she loves systems. And I think I do too. I love that she said that, that she used those words. Those are good words for me. I love systems as well. And so all of a sudden I began to see in this like a system and a structure because it becomes a guide. And then we don't have to like, you know, muddle through all the time and figure it out. Once there's, you know, this is the beauty of a system and you can play with it once you're in it and familiar with it. But when you feel lost, it just guides you. It just carries you. It's like with the rhythm of breathing or the rhythm of music, it just carries you. And that support feels so good to me personally. Uh, on a personal <clears throat> note, I'd like to ask a question. I don't know if this is appropriate here when you were going through your divorce. <laughs> no, it's not that kind of inappropriate. Um, I have a tendency <clears throat> to forget where my support is, my spiritual support. So you're saying this is, you know, what what gets us through is our whether it's music, the the system, you know, what mm -hmm. we do. Did you find at all that you lost sight of that? 
at all as you were going through your process? Or did you find that, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Um, so I, for myself, I find that when things get really, really hard for me, mm. they're all about the goddess. Yeah, and I hear you there. I have to come back. Some, someone reminds me and I have to come back. Mm -hmm. As you said, this is what gets us, this is what gets us through. It's our emotional support, whether it's come through our meditation, um, our ritual, our music. So did you find that having your spiritual, your flame tending practices helped you get through everything that you had gone through? Yes, actually. And it wasn't as fully developed a practice as it is right now at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but part of it was still developing. And that was part of it as a creator that did help me get through it was not only did I already have a little piece in place, I had at one point what I had was little prayers I'd written, uh, brief daily prayers to breed that revolved around the themes of each of the Oum trees. And so oh. that was a daily practice for myself. And it wasn't, um, you know, overly deep or overly long, so I could fit it in, yeah. which was important at the time when I had so much to manage that was truly crazy making. Um, so yes, that definitely did give me a foundation and a base and something to kind of carry me through and support me. And then, like I said, as a creator, when all the other pieces began coming to me as well, that to me becomes very exciting. And yeah. so everything I've written about is not just like an idea I had in my head. It was something I sat down and did over and over and over and journaled each experience over and over and over to understand how is this feeling to me? How is this impacting me? How is she speaking to me? Is this where it needs to be? Is it changing? Is it refining? Is it morphing? Um, just being in that creative mm -hmm. process is a support and, you know, kind of a distraction from everything else you have to do yeah. because yeah. in that moment, energy is flowing and you're flowing with it. And when you're flowing, you're not stagnating and it, it brings you a level of power, at least like in terms of energy to help you get through the hard things as yeah. well. It's yeah. nourishing. It fed me to be in that creative process. That's lovely. Thank really. you. Thank you. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit, um, from breed and the flame tending in your book and your poetry. Oh, wait, before we get into the next thing, would you please read us your other poem? Please? I would be happy to. Thank you. So this is the poem at the conclusion of my book. It's called Forge. Hammer and tongs in hand. I settle myself at the forge. The fire is built, the bellows have blown, and the ore stands ready, poured into forms resembling joy and fear, security and confidence, comfort and chaos. The power of the hammer must now shape them, like bones, like limbs, and I feel each blow on my skin as I fashion the form I wish to take and shape the life I wish to live. Molten gold becomes my marrow as I gleam from within from a secret flame, and I speak with a tongue of fire as poetry flows from my head like a river of lava, creating the land where I will live, and all those who also burn with love and truth and mirth and grief may join me here on this island of coals floating on a cosmic sea. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, so everybody go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and pre-order this book so that uh, you automatically will get it in June. Yes. And so why don't we switch gears just a little bit? So you are the owner of Sunshine Editorial Services and Book Coaching. I am, yes. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about that? I started my editorial service a couple of years ago. Um, being a writer, being a poet, being a word person, this is work I love to do. I love supporting other writers and helping them develop their books. So I focus primarily on the editing side and developmental editing and in books that are similar to mine in terms of being creative nonfiction, um, spirituality books, holistic health and wellness books, 
how-to books, memoirs, self-help, personal development. And I've, um, oh, thanks for popping in the link there. I appreciate that. Um, oh, a couple of them. Thank you so much, Jenna. Or is that you, Morgan? That is, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, and I've begun adding book coaching to my services where um, in a developmental edit, I go through a manuscript and offer writing guidance on how the writer might revise their work to improve it. In book coaching, I can work with a writer as they're developing their book idea before they've written it to help them create a solid foundation for it, um, a strong scaffolding and design for it, a, uh, a form and a structure for it, and a sense of how they're going to move through each stage of it so that they'll know exactly where they're going as they're writing each stage and help them with uh, a couple of those chapters so they'll know how to best structure those and write those as well. And, give them a, a schedule so they'll have a timeline for when they know they'll have a finished book. That's wonderful. So it's nice that everything just sort of all, all comes together. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask of Erin? We've got about 15 minutes. Thanks to everyone who's coming and listening so far too. I really appreciate you. And I wanna say special hellos to my friend Josephine and my friend Cheryl who are out watching. And uh, oh, Cheryl says you're a book midwife. <laughs> yeah, I love how you phrased that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank so, you friends for being here. So what else would you, so, okay, your, your Facebook author, Erin Aurelia is where you're using that is kind of, you said a blog as opposed to a, a separate. Well, I have two pages. I have, yeah, Erin Aurelia author is one Facebook page where I talk about my book and things about Bridget. And then I have Erin Aurelia poetry, which is another Facebook page where I post okay. my poetry and videos of uh, poetry performances. Oh, okay. I get it. That's also Facebook, Erin Aurelia poetry. Yes. Erin Aurelia poetry is on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Erin Aurelia author is only on Facebook and also on Facebook. I manage a group uh, for fellow breed devotees and flame tenders that's uh, named after my book. It's called The Torch of Breed. So uh, anyone's welcome to join who is interested in talking more about breed and working more deeply with her. And, um, <clears throat> and I share some essays there about how I view her through the seasons, because I also see the four seasons reflecting in the four acme of the Oum, which then reflect in those four faces of breed as seasonal elements, as well as only through the 20 day cycles. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Sha is asking, what's your favorite part of working with breed? And Ben, uh, asks, do you find landscape affects your practice? Being in Washington State, when you travel, do you find different faces of breed or is she universal for you? Shaw, sure. I would say my favorite part of working with breed is uh, being always in a dance with the inspiration that she brings me. Um, the being in the creative energy, whatever she shows me, meditating with her, I guess, is my favorite element because that's where it comes through. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, going into that deep meditation where I sit with her, I can ask questions, I can receive through visualizations or through an oracle. And being able to more deeply delve into what she shows me. These are, I mean, I find things I hadn't seen before. This entire practice was something I hadn't seen before until I feel like she began leading me and showing it to me. And it's just sort of a, a constant trail. It's like literally following the torch of greed. It's just, I just keep following her and she keeps showing me new things. And, and uh, I love that constant learning and creating and being in her flow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Ben's question. It's an interesting question, Ben, and I definitely appreciate the element of locality and 
working with the space in which we find ourselves, the space that nourishes us, the space that is effectively our neighbors, our everyday neighbors. I resonate with Breed as the sun. There is a, a poem and prayer in which she is related to as um, the, um, I just lose the line as soon as I try to quote it. But uh, in, in the tradition, she is equated with the sun. And the sun has that sense of universality to it. And so I don't necessarily see her as strictly tied to landscape in that sense, but more in terms of cycles as the sun moves in cycles. That's where I see her most resonant personally. Okay, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Teen time. Is it possible to access your book writing services for guidance with other pantheons? Example, guidance with a Norse goddess devotional book. Yes, that sounds like so much fun mm -hmm. to help you work on. I would love to. Absolutely. If anyone wants to uh, reach out with me and talk with me about book coaching and editing, you can reach me at Erin at sunshineeditorialservices.com. And I would love to hear all your book ideas. <laughs> it's again, it's that creativity and the inspiration and creating and being in the flow. And I'm just excited, just as excited to work with other writers when they are in their creative flow as I am when I'm in my own. It's all, it's all like play to me. It's like not even work. It's just, this is play. Can we play? Let's, let's play. <laughs> so much fun. Yes. It is playing, playing with words. Yes. They're my favorite toys. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> yes, indeed. I have been pregnant with a book forever. Okay. Carol, I want to hear all about your book. You know I do. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jen. It's all fun and games until. <laughs> so you <laughs> your deadline. Yes. Oh, that is the thing. Um, <laughs> if you decide to pursue a, a book contract and you get a book contract, then you will be given a deadline. Yes. And for those writers who feel like they can never seem to finish their book because they want to self-publish or they haven't looked toward that yet, I actually recommend giving yourself a deadline. Um, I know for myself, I work well with deadlines, which is partly why editing work is fine for me to do. I, other people tell me, oh, my gosh, all those deadlines. How can you handle that? Um, deadlines are fine with me because they let me know that's when I get to be done. So I like deadlines. I think I would like it if they gave me a deadline that was actually two weeks before the deadline and just not tell me that's the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> People used to do that with me with, when I was somewhere. <laughs> yes, they would say, Erin, we need you to be there at four o'clock when they wanted me there at five. Exactly. That was the best exactly. way to get me there by five. <laughs> I mean, I think of it like, okay, I'm going to sleep. I don't want to wake up yet. I hit that button, I go back to sleep. I and I'm I got two more weeks. Just don't tell me I have two more weeks. <laughs> yeah, but editor. Is point is liminal space. <laughs> well played, Ben. Well played. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, editors so, know how writers are. Yes, it's true. And being a writer myself, I feel like it helps me understand the, the editing and book coaching process even better because I know it from the editing side and I know it from the author's side. I know what it's like yeah. to, to like, I have all this in my head and I want to put it on the page. And once it's there, is it going to make sense in anybody else's head? <laughs> that was, that was my so. biggest question when I started writing was, how do I make this make sense to other people? I have so much going on up here and it makes sense to me, but... I have to explain it clearly now so other people will know what I'm on about. <laughs> yeah, so, so that it makes sense as opposed yes. to, you know, we can follow those lines. Yes, exactly. It us to hear that led us to hear to hear, but, but nobody else, nobody gets that. And then one of the things we didn't really talk about is what is the trio? We just sort of, you know, talked about it as though people understand. And probably this audience largely does. And I think a lot of my readers will. But I didn't want to assume all my readers would. So I had to think when I was writing this book, which pieces do I introduce first? How do I need to present them so that they're clear enough concepts to someone who's unfamiliar, but isn't so informative that it's overwhelming and discouraging to the reader? Um, 
So that's part of a challenge, especially when you're writing about a pantheon, because you're writing to people who don't necessarily know what those things are. You know what they are. Right. But how do you help a brand new reader understand what they are? That's part of the process and knowing what your clear message is that you want to convey and knowing who you're talking to and how they're going to understand it. These are key pieces to developing a solid foundation to any book like this. Good to know, because I'm actually in the process of writing another book. <laughs> what are you writing about, may I ask? Um, Do you want to say? Yeah, I, I talked about it before, and then I kind of messed it up with, with a publisher, so I'm starting sort of from scratch. It's the connection between Celtic lands and I, the Celtiberians. So it's oh, cool. northern, northern Spain, the connection with the, the, the Celtic lands and how they went back and forth between Portugal, Spain, and ancient Britain. Oh, fascinating. Because I'm Portuguese, so... Okay, that's but very cool. I felt that you know that Celtic pull, and then I found out there actually is something that's right that there. Makes them, and that was like I was like jumping up on the inside, jumping up yes. and down. Like, yes, 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 yes. So that's kind of what I, my focus has been a little off lately, as I'm sure you know. Um, but it's 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 in the process. Fantastic. Yeah, looking forward to that. Well, let me know if you're ready for an editor. I'd be happy to. I, I will. Thank you. Yay. So, so poor Ben. I feel that on a deep level. I was saying recently, I felt like my work was chicken scratch after four months of trying to edit. Oh, Ben, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we can always be our harshest critics. That's absolutely true. And that's the thing that an editor gives you and a book coach gives you is perspective. Is someone else can look at it and let you know what they see because we always just primarily tend to see our flaws. Yes. That isn't all we write. We don't only write flawed work. So letting others show you, here's what's happening in your work. Here's what's actually working here. And here are some ways you can improve it. It can uh, be a more encouraging message. And I love working as a book coach while my clients are writing because I get to support them and encourage them and cheerlead them on the way because I'm truly excited about anyone who's engaging in creative work, especially with words, because I get words. Well, since Ben also mentioned, uh, you know, that the deadline is a liminal space, I think we should take what we think of our flaws and stick them in a liminal space and just, <laughs> just keep moving forward, doing the best that we can. That's the key is not to get caught up in editing along the way. Just keep moving forward. Editing is a stage and it comes, but not during the actual creating phase. That's right. its own phase. Right. And you got to let that energy flow and go where it wants to. And you can check it later. You know, I did a little bit of self-editing along the way, but it wasn't so much I need to edit that or I think that's awful as much as I would get a new sense of, oh, wait a minute, I got a better idea about that. So then I would go back and rework and go now. OK, that makes more sense. And that helps me move on, move right. on to this. Well, so so it, Jenna just said something that was kind of funny. OK, it's part of the process. Sometimes it's like this is OK, then this is such crap. And then this is done. And then later, you know, this isn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it can be intense being in the middle of creative processes and energy. It's true. <laughs> oh, wow. So thank you, Ben. I like that. There's a Center for Bridge for Breed in Portugal. Oh, quick on the Googling there, Ben. Yeah, oh, that's God. awesome. It's not really coming up as a link, but I'm just going to. Sha, can you get that for me, please? <laughs> yes, Sha, absolutely. Why deadlines are helpful. <laughs> yes, because sometimes you just have to be done and leave it alone and let it be done. And um, if you don't have a deadline, you can just edit yourself to death and forever and never be done. <laughs> yes. Oh, this this is this has just been lovely. I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed this. So have I. Thank you, Morgan. This has been a great <laughs> time. So, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on before we say, well, before I give my my push for Women in Magic conference tomorrow? <laughs> um, just to say that I've got a couple other projects in the works. 
that are in the uh, inspirational phase at this point in very, very, very early developmental phases. Um, one of them is a series of courses that I would like to present for devotees of breed to delve more deeply specifically into each of the four faces of breed. And I would also like to create another book that presents the idea of an oracle of breed. Oh, nice. Um, that is also using the OM as a base, but is not necessarily a set of cards put together itself, but a framework of understandings and meanings to work with so that the reader can create their own card set. Oh, that sounds lovely. So the Owen is definitely flowing over there. Yes, she keeps talking to me and inspiring me. And if anyone else has an, uh, an opinion here, I'd love you to drop it in the chat if you feel like uh, you would be interested in that idea of an oracle where there are there's guidance created that presented for you and meanings for each of what the cards would be in relation to breed, but that you create it yourself. Would you like to? Would you like to do that? Or would you rather have cards made for you? I think making cards <laughs> gets you like a lot of so, so yeah, so Ben says like cards against humanity, but involving <laughs> Ohm. Love that. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that particular melding. That's <laughs> Against you. <laughs> so funny. Um, so um, the choice, a good night to Erin. I would like to just put a little plug in. Uh, the Coracle, which is what you've been watching this evening, this morning, this afternoon. This is Coracle <laughs> Live. But Coracle Live is part of a larger ongoing educational online platform of the Sisterhood of Avalon called the Coracle. And tomorrow we have um, Women in Magic conference starting at 11 a.m. Stop it, Jenna. <laughs> Stop. 11 a.m. Eastern time till 5 p.m. Eastern time. We have Brandy Williams doing a keynote. We have wonderful women from diverse um magic paths on a panel and then we will have two workshops and um jenna will be on the panel i will be there jenna will be there and it's going to be a wonderful day tickets are still on sale for till, till, till tomorrow morning i think jenna um so i highly recommend suggest beg you <laughs> <laughs> to go over to the SOA Facebook page, which is where you are, and uh, click on it and 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 register for um, this workshop all day conference. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So tickets are available until it <laughs> starts. <laughs> and there's Shah has put in the link to the Women in Magic if you'd like to join us tomorrow. So Erin, I can't thank you enough. This has been wonderful i really really enjoyed it you have any any more poetry you'd like to read before we before we say good night oh i don't have any more bridget related poetry what else you got about oh gosh <laughs> oh all kinds of it's it's uh oh i don't know I don't know. It was. Did I put you on the spot? I'm sorry. No, a little okay. bit. Okay, you want to hear? All right, you want to hear some poetry? <laughs> okay, this is going to be in my feral collection, and um, this I'm is here. this is more uh, representative of how I tend to write. <clears throat> this is called Untilled. I walk untilled, unkilled unhindered by the extraneity of furrowed rows and the seeds of expectation, that assignment of determined manifestation of the predetermination of straight lines like straight jackets, shaving minds like a straight edge of the microbial dirt, feathering all of our skin. I cannot begin to give in to the glamour of these untenable rules, breaking my teeth against rocks, against plows, against every cold steel that would 
unpeel the stars from my bones and ravage my throat and steal my voice that's blending like rivers falling from defiant mountains that will not hold false echoes, will not hold false hands, will not hold false guns against my head. I will stare them down with supernovas bleeding from my eyes and unwind every breath, suggesting that I should turn over my sod to feed their gaping mouths. That was great. Thank you. That was great. I really Appreciate liked it. that. She's slam, sister. So, team, <laughs> so what is your Instagram again, Erin? I am on Instagram on two pages, teen. I am at Erin Aurelia Poetry and also Book Coaching with Erin. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, so thank you, everyone, for joining us at whatever time it is. Teen says it's a morning for her. It's nine o'clock in the evening for me, and it's what little in the evening for Erin. So I yeah. thank you all for joining us. Uh, hope some of you will join us um, tomorrow for Women in Magic, and please keep an eye out on the Sisterhood of Avalon uh, Facebook page for our next Coracle Live books, bards, and ballads. I cannot tell you who it's going to be because I don't know yet. But please keep please keep an eye on the page and uh, join us next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erin. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Morgane and Sisterhood of Avalon for having me. I had okay. such a great time. Thanks, great. everyone who came and listened and asked questions. <laughs> Appreciate everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.